Good morning and welcome to our online service. My name is Ian. And I'm Christine, and I am so glad that you are here worshiping with us this morning. Today we're talking about a really cool topic, that of what it means to finish well, as we look at the end of Paul's third missionary journey. So I'm really glad you're here with us. Yeah, and I think the topic of finishing well is, is a really great topic because it compels us to think about how we're living right now. Because in order to finish well, we have to live into how God is calling us to live in the moment. And one of the things that God is calling us to is generosity. And one thing I love about grace is that we are a generous people. And I want to encourage you to continue in that generosity, continue giving. And there's a myriad of ways to give. You can give on our website. You can click the give link on your on your page, or you can text any amount to 84321 to begin your gift. And one of the things that our giving does is it allows us to continue on with our ministries. And as a student ministry director, I can say that your gifts mean so much to us. They allow us to continue in what God is doing in the lives of our students, and He's doing amazing things. Um, for example, we're going on a mission trip this summer, and we're super excited about that and what God's going to do through it. Yeah, we're actually going to Detroit in just a couple of weeks. And if you want to keep up with what's happening at Grace in all of our ministries, from Grace Kids to Young Professionals to Grace Student Ministries, I want to invite you to follow us on Instagram and Facebook and whatever other social media platform you use so that you can keep up with exciting things like our Detroit mission trip and see what's going on here at Grace. See, one of the things that God calls us to is community, living together um, for the glory of God. And um, that's something that Pastor Dave Collins is actually going to be touching on a little bit later. So I'm really excited as to hear what he has to say as he continues and wraps up our four-week series titled Road Trip. So as we continue on in worship, I want to encourage you to sing with us as we praise our great God. The same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh, yes, I will.
How was the trip? Well, on the first day, I was so miserably tired from driving, I could hardly stay awake. And then on the second day, I got chiggers, which are small, tiny bugs. And when they bite you, they leave a rash like poison ivy that lasts for days. 
And on the third day, I lost my wallet. And then for the next seven days after that, I woke up every night with headaches from the altitude. And then as the week went on, I only saw about half of the things on my list. And on the last night, driving through a storm, I hit an antelope and did over $2,500 damage to the car. And then we decided we'd had enough and we went home early. So how was the trip? Well, if you just had that list I ran through, you'd think it was a pretty awful trip. But I have to tell you, it was the trip of a lifetime. Back in 2017, I went to Yellowstone National Park and it was awesome. We saw a buffalo and a bear and antelope and marmots and, and pikas. We climbed a 10,000 foot mountain and, and we rode horses and saw geysers and went fishing and hiked in pristine Rocky Mountain wilderness. There was no question about whether this was a great trip. But you know, there's always a question about how trips are evaluated. How was the trip? What makes for an enjoyable, fun, or meaningful journey? And when you get to the end of the trip, how do you know if it was good? It's an interesting question because the answer doesn't depend on whether there were challenges or problems or whether you did everything on your list, or, or whether you had all the gear that you thought you needed, or whether the trip was shorter or longer than you expected. You know, we're heading right into the heart of summer, and many of us are going to go on some sort of trip in the next couple months. And all of us, we're all journeying through this next phase of our post-pandemic life. So how will we know at the end of this summer, or at the end of this year, whether it was a good one? from a more metaphorical or philosophical standpoint, if we were to look back on this part of our life or our life as a whole, how would we know when we get to the end of the road how to evaluate it? Today is the end of our series called Road Trip when we've been looking at the missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul. And today we're looking at the end of the road, the end of Paul's third missionary journey, which was really the beginning of his final journey his trip to Rome. Paul had been warned that this next trip would be the end of the road for him. And history shows the validity of those warnings he received. He was indeed headed towards prison and ultimately death. And so as he knew he was getting close to the end, he got together some leaders from the churches that he'd worked with and he gave a farewell speech. I'd like to read some of that speech for you. It's from Acts chapter 20. And we'll see how Paul evaluated his journeys. So he got everyone together and he said, you know how I've lived the whole time I was with you. You know that I've taught you publicly and from house to house. And I've declared to both Jews and Greeks, that's his way of saying to, to everyone in the world, that they must, be, they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel, the good news of God's grace. Now, I know that none of you among whom I've gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. So keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. And Paul's speech continues on, but this is really the heart of it. And from his heart, two things stand out about how he views or evaluates his missionary journeys. The first one, the first idea that stands out, it's a little more philosophical or intellectual, but, but bear with me because it's a very, very powerful word or idea. It's the word transcendence, which the dictionary tells us means moving beyond limits, going beyond ordinary limits, the ordinary limits of a trip that have to do with time and energy and money and destinations and a list of sights to see with fuel and food and gear and weather. Those are the ordinary limits of a trip, but the transcendent realities of a trip or a journey go beyond all of those things. In fact, 
those things can and usually do go wrong on a trip. But trans transcendent realities go beyond that. Transcendent realities have to do with identity and meaning and purpose and, and feeling and emotions and, and values. That's the stuff that can't be measured or, or counted or, or tallied up. Some years ago, uh, my wife Deb and I and the kids went to the Ann Arbor Folk Festival at Hill Auditorium to see the band, the Avid Brothers. The tickets weren't cheap for us. The seats, honestly, were pretty bad. And the show before us went on way too long. But when the Avid Brothers began to play, we weren't thinking about our seats or the tickets or how much time had passed. We were experiencing transcendence. Our hearts were lifted beyond all of that to a different place of meaning and significance. A similar feeling happened a couple weeks back when I was officiating a wedding. It was 90 degrees out. The place we were in had no air conditioning. The bridal party arrived late at the venue, so the wedding started a half hour late. Uh, and there was the usual last minute angst about who was seated where and where the rings were and, and all that. But then the bride came down the aisle and, and we were no longer thinking about all of that stuff. All we could think about was the deeper meaning and purpose that, that goes beyond the limits of, of flower arrangements and tuxes and dresses and, and caterers and venues. Transcendence. Our hearts were moved to the deepest realms of love and commitment and family and togetherness and meaning. And, and transcendence isn't just a reaction to a feeling. Transcendence, it has to do with purpose that translate or catalyzes into action. It, it's about overarching values and commitments that move us beyond the ordinary limits that we live with. We, we saw that and, and we cheered it on uh, in the height of the pandemic when we saw doctors and, and healthcare workers uh, working long shifts under difficult conditions. We cheered for them. We see that same kind of transcendence and cheer it on when we see first responders like the two police from the department where I serve as chaplain who were the first on the scene in the Briarwood Mall shooting earlier this year, running right towards danger while everyone else was running away from it. We cheer that on. Transcendence, purpose, meaning, vision, direction that moves beyond ordinary limits, that, that catalyzes action. Transcendence is what we see uh, when Paul says uh, to the folks he gathered together, however I consider my life worth nothing to me, my only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel, the good news of God's grace. Uh, Paul's vision for the end of the road went beyond the ordinary limits of travel in his times, uh, beyond ships and trade routes and, and tent making and packing food for the journey and carrying letters of introduction, the customary, the everyday, the grind, beyond emails and texts and instant messages, beyond responding to Slack and phone calls and Google and Instagram and Snapchat and Reddit and TikTok. Transcendence. The word race that Paul uses here uh, is the Greek word dromos. Dromos means course or track. In ancient times, you would see this word in words like hippodrome, which is, uh, uh, looks like this in the ancient world, which is a track or a course uh, for horses or chariot racing. If you've ever seen that classic film, Ben-Hur, you see one of the great chariot races of all time. In our era, we still use a similar word. It's the U word velodrome, which means bike track or bike course, and we, we actually have a velodrome right over in Detroit. But the track or course that, that Paul was on wasn't about horses or, or chariots or, or bikes. It was about the gospel. Paul's transcendent course or track or purpose was the gospel. It moved him, catalyzed his actions to go beyond the limits that society, that people, that culture tried to impose his transcendent purpose moved him beyond the limits of even life itself. 
So not too long after Paul made this farewell speech, he was in prison because of his faith. But gospel transcendence meant that he would continue despite the limitations of chains and cells. He wrote letters from prison, and we have uh, many of them. Seven of them became books in the New Testament. And in them, we find one of his greatest statements of gospel transcendence. He wrote, uh, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. This is the statement of someone uh, who has answered the question of how to evaluate a journey or a trip or a season of life. Paul knew that in the resurrection, Jesus transcended death, went beyond the limits of death so that his death on the cross could become eternal life for us. And of course, uh, where I'm headed with all this is the question for us, what is transcendent in our lives? What course or track arches over our day-to-day ordinary realities? What moves us or, or catalyzes us to go beyond the limits of our busyness, past what can be counted or, or accomplished or organized or checked off a list? You know, sometimes our hearts just can't get past our own limitations to what is most important. to to what is transcendent. And honestly, Paul's statement echoing down from the first century to live as Christ and to die as gain, it can seem pretty remote. Uh, When we hear it, we think, well, of course, Paul said that. He's an apostle and all that, but but I'm not that. I'm I'm, I'm me. And on my best days, I'm not really very apostolic. But friends, you need to hear this. The gospel calls us beyond the barriers in our hearts. The gospel calls us beyond the barriers in our hearts, whatever they are. And the question for you and I isn't, how am I being an apostle? But how is my life on track, on course, being catalyzed with the transcendent gospel of Jesus Christ? You see, the apostle Paul, if he were standing here right now, would be cheering on Jesus' transcendence through our ordinary lives. Like when our convictions catalyze us beyond just spending all of our time and our money on ourselves, and we take steps of generosity with our time and our talent and our treasure so the kingdom mission of God can advance. That's gospel transcendence. Or when our compassion moves us beyond our post-pandemic tunnel vision of just caring for ourselves and our family, and we look for opportunities to extend kindness to people we work with or live near. That's gospel transcendence. Or when our relationships with those who need hope in the world activates our courage and we invite our friends to church or to community group or just into our backyard for barbecue or friendship, or we just let them know quietly that we're praying for them. That's gospel transcendence. That's Jesus' good news pressing us, calling us, urging us beyond our busyness, beyond our hesitation, beyond just focusing on our own situations. It's that overarching purpose or course that catalyzes us to head right towards need, to activate towards friendship, to move to sacrifice, even while others around us might be going the other way. And you know Jesus is cheering us on towards that. In the ways that matter most, our journeys, whether it's a vacation with our family this summer or our walk through this next week or season, or even how we look back at the whole of our life, our journeys are measured by transcendence. That is the movement of the gospel in and through us beyond ordinary limitations and barriers. But there was another marker for Paul, another qualifier for his travels, another way that he knew his journeys had been worthwhile and meaningful and significant. And this has to do with other people. Paul knew that our journeys are fulfilled through relationships. Our journeys are fulfilled through our relationships. And and we know this on on a very basic level. Uh, One time years ago on a men's mission trip, I went on to to Tijuana, Mexico, that was full of transcendence from from the very beginning. We were working in a development project uh, in an under-resourced neighborhood, a shanty town, 
but it was also full of profound relationships in, in surprising ways. So on the very first day of that trip, uh, my roommate was, was bit by a neighborhood dog. Now, the dog didn't have rabies, but there was a strong possibility of infection, and he was bit right in the, in the upper thigh, right where you can't quite see if you try to look behind you. So for the rest of the trip, at the end of each day as his roommate, I had the task of kind of eyeballing that dog bite to check for signs of infection. Not a way that I'd recommend getting to know someone better, not the best uh, source of roommate bonding, but I have to say that small act of necessary but, but super awkward companionship was one of the things that made the trip remarkable. I was just texting with him this week about that. It was, the trip was 14 years ago, but we still remember our friendship and our connection and how those awkward but necessary moments were part of the significance of that trip. Journeys are fulfilled through relationships. And, and Paul expressed that uh, in his farewell speech. Uh, notice what he says about being with others. He says, you know how I lived the whole time I was with you. They, Probably weren't checking dog bites, but still they knew how each other lived. And, and he says that he taught publicly and from house to house. Uh, imagine getting ready for church on Sunday mornings and, and then the preacher, the pastor, the apostle Paul shows up. Hello, time for church right on your front porch. And, and notice what he says to them about how they're to continue on in their own journey after he's gone. Uh, he says, Keep watch over yourselves. Literally, uh, this is in the second person pearl. The, the southern version of this would be all y'all take care of yourselves. Take care of each other, one another, and the rest of the church. You see, Paul knew and understood that journeys are fulfilled through relationships, that God has designed us to journey together. So if the gospel is calling us beyond the barriers in our hearts, and we're designed to journey with others, how do we head down the roads towards transcendence and relationships, whether it's with that family trip next month or a walk through the rest of 2021 or even the whole journey of life itself? Well, here's a, a thought experiment to, to try to, to start out, to get started down that road. You can actually try it right now and, and maybe talk about it later with your family or friends. Here it is. You can ask yourself this question, how do I want to remember this next season of my life? Or how do I want to remember the rest of this year? Or when you look back on this month or this year, seven years from now, what do you want to look back on? Or who do you want to look back on? How will you answer that question? How was the trip? Your answer, your memory, well, it could be about how you kept your head down, your nose to the grindstone, your foot to the gas pedal, making sure you checked everything off, your to-do list, replied to every email, stayed caught up with Reddit and TikTok and, and watched every episode of that new show that's just coming out on Netflix. That, that could be what you remember. Or responding to Jesus cheering you on towards his transcendent purposes and relationships you might change the overarching track or course that you're on. And then you could share about how you remember moving towards that hurting person nearby you with gospel compassion. Or you might be able to share about how you remember the courage and, and the nerves it took to finally invite that friend to church. Or you might be able to share about how you remember laughing with your community group as you all realized how much you deeply depend on God's grace. Or you might remember that one time that you took on a summer morning to pour out your heart to God. What do you want to remember about the trip? Paul said, my only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. How will you answer the question down the road when someone asks you, how was the trip? Let me pray. God, for so many of us, we're hungry for transcendence and relationships that are rich and meaningful and deep. And we get caught up so often in things that we can count and manage and deal with and quantify. 
God, give us the grace of your Spirit to move us past that, to lift our hearts, to stir us up to things that matter, to the gospel, to living for you, to extending your compassion and your care, your forgiveness, and your joy beyond just what we can see in front of us, to the people you've called to us, to the people you've put into our lives. God, give us this grace so that we will, when we look back on our journeys, we can say that trip was epic. In Jesus' name. One of the things that really stood out to me and really convicted me personally about Dave's message is how easy it is to get caught up in the day-to-day -day and keep our noses to the grind, right, like he said, and lose sight of what's most important, of, of the reasons why we're here. So I felt challenged personally to really keep my focus on Christ this week going out from here. Yeah, and I, I think a great way that helps us keep our eyes on Christ is, is having a community around us that mm -hmm. refocuses us. Um, the point of community is to encourage one another and challenge one another and lead each other toward Jesus. And so if you're not plugged in with community, I, I really encourage you to do that. Join a community group. Um, if you're not joining a community group, get connected with our social media. That's a great way to get connected with people, meet people that way and, and get together for coffee maybe. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's, it's an awesome way for us to make sure we are focusing on the things that matter. Yeah, yeah, living in community in person can make such a difference. And that's one of the reasons that every week we want to invite you to come to an in-person service at any of our locations. And if you see one of us at Grace Canton, Grace Ann Arbor, Grace Ann Arbor West, be sure to stop and say hi. Well, help us get to know you so that we're able to get you connected to the body of Christ here in Ann Arbor and Canton and in this area. Because yeah, living in community, it's so key. Yeah, yeah, it's absolutely essential. Mm -hmm. um, and starting next week, we are beginning a new sermon series called Summer Playlist. And at each of our different locations, we're gonna be talking about different things, mm -hmm. um, things that are specific to, to that location and that community. Um, so we encourage you to come check it out. I'll be preaching, Christine will be preaching, Dave will be preaching, and it's gonna be awesome. Um, and I highly encourage you to join us in worship. Yeah, so we hope that we will see you next week, whether it's online or in person. Until then, go and be the church. <laughs>